still be here when the year started up again. From the very beginning of this revival, we knew the Lord Jesus was in charge. This is not man. This is not anything we've designed. 
and he's so big and he's so wonderful. He's in charge of everything that happens. Everything that happens is Father Filter. So it causes me to be able to dance and just relax and to know that he is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings and whatever he wants to happen will happen. He's Lord over cancer. He's Lord over tuberculosis. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together as we enter into.
everybody. Jesus. Jesus. 
God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him and upon him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is the gospel. What manner of love would a man have that he would lay down his life for a friend? And why would it be that the king of creation would send his son to die on the cross for lowly mankind. I don't understand it, Lord, but it's the gospel. It's the good news. And it all, and it all hinges on one name. No name given in heaven or hell or anywhere else that my men may be saved but the name of Jesus. So I want you to lift up your voice saint and sinner in this place tonight and give honor to the name of Jesus because there's power in his name there's redemption in his blood there's glory in his eyes I want you to lift up your voice and your hands and let's cause these raptors to rock for the praises of the Lord
just you, lift your voice and say it one more time. I love you, Jesus. Say his name, Jesus. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. <clears throat> all I I give you praise of all that I adore is in you. Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul. to honor you to honor you Lord with all my heart Lord with all my heart I worship you I worship you all I have within me Lord all I have within me I give you praise I give Oh, 
tonight we've come to this place of outpouring Jesus and we ask you to search us through and through we have an idea that you're up to something in this world Lord but you can't use vessels that are white on the outside but inside are full of guile and filth so we ask you Lord to search us search us Lord purify your church Lord as gold in the furnace, purify us, Lord. We give you everything, Lord.
praise you, Lord. We glorify your name, Jesus. Blessed be the Lord.
<laughs> Woo, the Lord's in the house tonight. Most of you are enjoying this, but there's some of you out there, you're going, man, when are they going to stop singing? See, we believe that according to your relationship and your opinion of the Lord is going to be your worship. David knew the Lord in a very personal way, and he said, you know what? Because I think God is great, I think he greatly deserves my praise. I've been in some church services, I wondered what their opinion of the Lord was. It seemed like it was mediocre is the Lord and mediocre is his praise. But you know what? I'm so glad that I'm in the house tonight with people that have a high opinion of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe the Lord is great. I believe he's great. Some of you might go, well, you don't have to get so excited about that. You remind me of one of my teenagers one time. I had this young teenager. He, well, actually, when he came to me, he, uh, when this happened, he was in his uh, upper teens. But he was in my youth group for eight years. He was raised in the church. His mother went to the church. She made him go to church every time the doors were open. He was one of those quiet kids, always sat in the back. This was not at this church, another church. And, uh, but he was in my youth group for eight years. I never heard him say ten words during that whole eight years. One afternoon, he called me up, and he said, Brother Richard, he says, do you have a few moments? I said, yes, I do. He says, I want to come talk to you. And I was, I was floored. I was like, whoa, this guy's wanting to talk to me. I said, I'll be here. So he came up to my office, and I'll never forget it, my friend. He had a computer paper, you know, the kind that's attached and he come in my office, he said, okay, here we go. And he flung this computer, there was like 10 sheets. And he was up all night long. The Holy Spirit was just dealing with this boy. And he said, okay, question number one. I knew I was in for it. And all of a sudden, this quiet kid, his neck got beaded red. You know, some people, when they get angry and nervous, they get real, their blood rashes. His face got red. His, his neck beat it up, and he said, All right, tell me, where does God get the audacity to demand my worship? That sure is egotistical. And I thought, oh, boy. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God hit me, and I said, Son, let me tell you something. Here's the reason why God demands your worship. The scripture says he's a jealous God, and the reason he is, is this. He knows that whatever you worship, you will become like that. If you worship pornography, you become a pervert. If you worship money, you become a greedy slob. I said, son, if you worship fame, I said, you'd be just nothing but an egotistical pig yourself. I said, son, listen to me. God knows that when you worship him, you actually become like him. And here's how it happens. See, the scripture says that God inhabits the praises of Israel. I believe that we are Israel today, that we are a spiritual form of Israel. When we worship God, God shows up. Amen? Amen. And when we're in the presence of God, all of a sudden, God begins to change us into his likeness. And I said, son, let me tell you something. You've got it backwards. It's not ego on his part. He's being gracious to you, son, because he knows that money, the worship of money, will never satisfy you. The worship, the worship of, of sports will never satisfy you. The worship of fame will never satisfy you. The only thing that will satisfy you is when you fulfill the purpose that he created you for, and that was to come into his likeness and image. And I just wiped my brow and said, shoo, I got through that one. And then he said, you know what? That answered all my questions. Yeah. 
You know what, church? I believe the Lord's great tonight. I believe he greatly deserves our praise. Hallelujah! <laughs> and let me tell you something else my friend you may come in here tonight and this may be totally strange to you you may be you may feel totally out of place you may come in here you might have a thousand questions you might go what in the world is going on listen my friend just like this young man I almost said his name just like this young man that came to my office all he needed to hear was just a voice from God. And listen, if you'll just open up your spirit tonight, you don't have to understand a lot of things. In fact, my friend, I don't understand a lot of things. I used to, have to, I used to feel obligated to try to explain certain things that happened in this revival. And finally one day it dawned on me, I can't explain how at the age of 16, as a, as a, as a good Catholic boy, he was in a Pentecostal church on the third row because I liked this filly. And the only, re the only way I could go out with her was her daddy said I had to go to church with her. So on Sunday morning, I was an altar boy, and Sunday night, I was in the Pentecostal church of 25. I was confused. And you know what, my friend? I can't tell you how, but I know it happened. One night, I was sitting in that little Pentecostal church. There was an evangelist there. I don't know his name. I don't know what he preached on. All I know is this, that the Spirit of God got a hold of my heart. And when I got out of that pew, and I walked down to the front of that big church of 25 people, and I, that was a long church, my friend. And I knelt down at that, that altar and I prayed a sinner's prayer. I can't explain it to you, but I can tell you it happened. I came up a new creature in Christ Jesus. And what he did for this confused little old 16 year old boy, let me tell you, my friend, what he did for me, he can do for you tonight. I don't care where you came from. I don't care how you got here. I don't care what your problem is. There's nothing that's too big for my God tonight. So let me tell you something, my friend. You did yourself a favor by coming here. This is one of the best things you've ever done. But listen, open up and let the Holy Spirit minister to you, okay? Don't feel like you have to understand everything because you're never going to understand everything. God's ways are higher than your ways and his thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And I don't care how brilliant you are, my friend, you'll never, ever understand everything about God. But just open up because he, he has brought you here tonight. Amen? Amen? Praise God. Why don't you turn to one another and greet each other in the love of the Lord tonight before you're seated. Uh, give a couple of three of you an opportunity to uh, share with us right now. And so if you're, if you're here and you have a testimony relative to the revival, what God has done for you here in the meeting, would you just lift your hand right now? Okay, just lift them up. Let me just look over the congregation. Brother, I'd like for you to come. Any others? Okay, sister. And uh, brother, you're right here. Okay, where is the, is this the lady? Okay, come on. Okay, just come on up, family. Bring them on up. Thank God. Okay. Those of you that I pointed out, just come on up. We'll take about three. So you're the head of this clan, sir? Yes, sir. Okay, tell us what your name is and where you're from. My name is Vernon Hunt. I'm from Winthrop Harbor, Illinois. It's a suburb of Chicago. Uh, my wife and I came to this revival about two months ago. Uh, we were here for uh, Halloween. And... That night, God worked mightily in my wife and I's life. I was healed in my back. My wife received the baptism. We were both slain in the spirit, Praise ate God. carpet for a long time. When we went home, we determined that we would bring our children back. And over, over uh, Christmas break, we asked the kids if they'd come down with us. And we came down, and last night, Pastor prayed for my oldest daughter, Christy, who's a sophomore in college. And as he was praying for her, he had my wife put her hand on her chest. And Christy has had a, a lung disease for the past seven years. The doctors have told her that she would never be completely well, that she would always have this disease that there would be infections that would come out of this disease for the rest of her life. 
Sometimes she can't hardly breathe. Pastor prayed for her. My wife felt the power and heard a crackling in her lungs as he prayed. And I asked my daughter last night on the way back, how do you feel? She says, my lungs are completely open. Praise God. And People have asked us why, why we want to come here. Why not? <laughs> and, 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 I, and, and I really found out today, standing in line out there, why we come here. There's an expectation that God's going to show up and God's going to perform miracles here. And I don't care if it's in Brownsville or in a warehouse in Chicago. If God's going to show up and heal my little girl, I'm going to ride that horse. Yes. Amen. Yes. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. And you're the mom, and y'all have what, three children? We have three daughters. This okay. is Christy and Katie and Kylie. And I understand that uh, something happened to you. You received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Is that right? On Halloween. <laughs> On Halloween. Don't you know that drove the devil nuts? <laughs> And, and you'd never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit before? No. I've prayed and prayed and felt that maybe there was something wrong with me because I never received it. And um, I just came here saying, Lord, I want everything you can give me. And I'm open and I want it. And I don't care what I look like. Okay. Okay. That's kind of, those are the kind of prayers that God answers, you know. When you just throw it all out there and say, Lord, whatever. Uh, just the, any way you want to do it, that's the way we'll take it. And that's the, that's the prayer God answers. So you folks were wonderfully blessed individually when you came down here in October. And uh, now God's just added a little, little, um, a little topping on the whole thing. All right, Christy, you're the one, right? Tell us about that disease and how it was affecting you. Um, well, I've had it for seven years. Um, it, was, it was horrible. It just affected my whole life. Um, I was always in hospitals and doctors' offices, and um, I don't know. It was just really hard. And last night, I I prayed all I prayed all day, yesterday that I would see a miracle. And I came, and he prayed for me, and I just fell back, and I could feel my chest just heaving, and I was. Gone. I was coughing all through church. I felt horrible all through church, and I could just breathe. And I went home, and I could breathe. And I woke up, and I could breathe. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! So, so your activities as a young person, normal activities of a young person, you just couldn't involve yourself with a lot of those. Is that right? Right. But now, what do you think you can do? I feel like I can do anything. Yeah. <laughs> Praise God. God bless you. Let's bless God for this family. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Tell us your name, where you're from. Lane Stewart from Waysboro, North Carolina. And I was down here two months ago, and I'm a pastor's wife. I was down here two months ago, and the Lord led me down here and on Saturday night I was determined I wouldn't want to pray for and I fought it and fought it just as hard as I could and my husband was was with me and he said you're gonna be prayed for I said no way I'm getting out of this place it was terrifying me scared me like crazy and what what is your what is your church background uh, Baptist so the <laughs> I, I can identify with that. That's my background. Okay. And so um, I, was, I came down Saturday night and, was, and I came to the altar for the first time. And I was trying to turn around and go back to my seat. And I started shaking her bed like I'm doing now. And I just could not move. And so 
I got prayed for and got slain in the spirit. And then I went back to my home church. And the Lord has dealt with me ever since. I've been like this ever since. <laughs> and there's my friends right there. <laughs> So these are these are your friends down here, and they know yeah. you've never done this before. No. Yeah. What? Well, two months ago. Yeah. What? Do, what do you think? Uh, think this is all about this shaking? What? Do, what do you think it's all about? I think the Lord's dealing with me and using me to get ready for church at, and at, back home at, at North Waysboro. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. God bless you. You know, uh, sometimes when when people see people shake like this, they wonder, well, what's the purpose of it? Well, we really don't know what the purpose is, you know. God's God, and his ways are above our ways. They're past finding out. And, uh, you know, if God made this lady, and he wants to shake her a little bit to get her ready for something, don't you think that's okay? Amen. God bless you, sis. Amen. <laughs> Let me ask you something. <laughs> I love this. You're too good to let go yet. <laughs> Just <like that. laughs> Uh, what what, uh, what does the church think uh, think about all this that you're you're a part of? These down here, this group, this this is the second time we've been down here, and um, well, I know they understand. understand yeah. But the ones back home, they don't understand at all. <laughs> so what do you think God's going to do with them? They, he's going to change them, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Let me tell you, when 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 folks see a person that's been one way for years, and now they're completely the difference uh, from what they were. It, it's going to speak wildly to the people. <laughs> this lady's not going to last much longer, so <laughs> help her down, boys. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> oh, I'd love to be a fly on the wall when it happens. <laughs> what is your name? Where are you from, brother? Uh, Alan Mather. I'm from Tulsa, Oklahoma. All right. This ought to be good, folks. <laughs> uh, this has been the most amazing year and a half. Um, a year and a half ago, somebody sent me a tape of this revival that was going on in Brownsville. And I got one little tape in the mail. And I was in a very powerful revival at Asbury College in 1970. And my heart has always been toward revival and the potential of what could happen in revival. I've read all these books by Finney and I, and I got little groups together and I said, you know, we can precipitate God into this nation. And, and I would read things by Wesley and, and, and these guys and, I, and it was like, my heart just cried and cried and cried for revival. And, and I had gotten discouraged. But when I got this one tape we sat up till three in the morning, mesmerized. I said, I didn't have to, I didn't worry about the shaking or anything that was going on. I could feel it. It was a video. It was, yeah, it was a video tape. It was the same spirit that I had known in the Asbury revival. Exactly the same. And I, and I, I was like, where, where can I find out more about this revival? What's going on? And, and I knew I had to get here and I knew I had to find out more about it. And the next night we went to the, the Tulsa Fair, just, just to kind of hang out, met a girl from this church, Amy Boone. I was like, you're from that church? I said, tell me about it. Sit down here. Tell me about it. I said, do you have any videos? She said, yes, I have a whole satchel full. My, my dad gives me all these videos. I said, bring them over, please. She brought me a whole satchel of, of, of videos from, from day one of the revival. And we set up night after night after night after night, wept. We couldn't go to bed. We were up till three in the morning some nights. Uh, uh, you know, we were getting very little sleep. And I, and I was like, this is it. I, if, if anybody has any doubts, I've been around a while. This, what is going on here is the real thing. Get in, get in. Don't. Don't play on the, the outskirts of this. The potential of what's going on here is staggering. This, this year has just been, it's like, I, I, I mean, the things that have happened. The other, the other day or, or a month ago, I gave a video. I've started making videos at home, you know. 
I got three VCRs and they're running and I'm sending them to, to missionaries and, and, and I've sent one to, to France, I've sent them to England, I've sent them all over the world, people everywhere. I gave one to the chaplain of Oral Roberts University a month ago. He played it for the entire student body, the, the Allison Ward video. Uh, I, I, I don't know how many we've made. We've made more, 300, or at least 300 videos. We have kids over at our house and they sit, they're all they're just kind of cold and cocky and they sit and we put a video on and their lives are changed. They, they literally leave from a video changed. We brought our, a youth group, our youth group down here of 30 kids. They're, they've never been the same. Uh, never been the same. It's, uh, it's, it's, all I can say is God is on the move. Get in, give him your whole heart. Don't hold back. Be done with the world. Get into what God is doing. Yes. Just give it up. Give it up. Just get, get in. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Get in to what God is doing. He is about to do something incredible. It is, it is getting stronger. It's getting stronger. Uh, you know, I, 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 could, I could go on with testimonies and testimonies. I got one last little quick thing. This is the re most recent one. Uh, here, I got here, uh, I had a horrible toothache, and I said, oh, boy, you know, at the revival with a horrible toothache, I had one of the brothers pray for me. It was, it was, the pain was so great that all I could do was get in the car and drive, and I was looking for a dentist office, and I didn't even know where I was. I got lost in town, and anyway, I, somebody told me there was one over here, and anyway, I ended up finding this guy, and he said, that all the dentists are closed today, he said, I'm, but I'm working on my office, and Anyway, we started talking, and he said, you know, why are you here? I said, I'm here for the revival. Uh, anyway, he ended up taking care of my tooth, and the bill was $118. And uh, I said, would you take Visa? He said, no. He said, no, he said, he said, would you use this money to bring more kids to the revival? I'll give it to you for free. I said, you got it. You got it. $118 is going to be for, for kids. Glory to God. <laughs> Uh, what was that dentist's name? Uh, let's see. I've got his name. <laughs> While you're looking for that, let me ask you this. Uh, what kind of church are you from in Tulsa? Uh, we're from a little church called Love and Grace. Okay. And uh, God's been doing mighty things, especially among the youth. Uh, it's just, it's been incredible. What the, there's some kids that, 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 one of them came over to our house the other day and her mom was cleaning clean our house and she says, is there a place I can go and pray? And I said, yeah, you know, we got this closet here, you can go and pray. And she said, can I have a video player? You know, she put on some Brownsville music and went in there and prayed. I kept hearing her in there, just pouring her heart out to God. Five hours later, she just comes out with a smile on her face, like, <laughs> like it was nothing. I was like, God, these are my heroes. My heroes are 14, 15 year old girls. You know, they're like, they're going for God. It's like it's like it's it, yeah. it, it, it's awesome. I I don't know. I'm I'm so thankful. I don't know. I don't understand why here. It didn't have to be in my town. It was it just had to be somewhere in America. Just somewhere. Yeah. I prayed for I prayed for years. For 26 years, I'd gather little groups around and we'd pray our hearts out, and it wouldn't happen. We'd pray our hearts out, and it wouldn't happen. It's happening. Yeah. You, you all do not realize the open window of opportunity that we have in this country. Yes. You who are younger, do not take this for granted. I've prayed my heart out for, for 26 years for revival. Do not take, please, don't just take this revival for granted and say, it'll come around again. No, this is an opportunity of a lifetime. And like Renner, Leonard Ravenhill said, an opportunity of a lifetime must be seized within the lifetime of the opportunity. We have an opportunity. Don't get, don't get in half-hearted. Please, I beg of you, go all the way. There's nothing out there in the world for you. There's nothing there but death. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. There's nothing out there but death. The gift of God, Jesus, is here. The gift of God is here to bring eternal life to you. Some of the people that came with us, they've, been, they've lived in life of drugs and all kinds of things. They know there's nothing out there. You don't even need Praise to. God. You don't even need to think. 
Jesus has the answer. Well, praise God. Let me just see that name. I don't want you to tell me. Okay. Uh, okay, I got it. I want to write him a note. Okay. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. So let's stand together. He has fire in his eyes, a sword in his hand. He's riding a white horse across this land. He has fire in his eyes, a sword in his hand. He's riding a white horse all across this land. He's calling out to you and me. Will you ride with me? He has fire in his eyes and a sword in his hand. He's riding a white horse across this land. He's calling out to you and me. Will you ride with me? Will you ride with me? We say yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We'll ride with you. And we say. scepter in his hand he's riding a white horse across this land he's calling out to you and me will you ride with me will you ride with me do we say yes lord fire in his eyes is his love for his bride and he's longing that she be with him right by his side that fire in his eyes is his burning desire that his bride be with him right by his side he's calling out to us right now will you ride with me Say yes, Lord. Yes, yes. Tonight. Say yes, Lord.
right, everybody sing. Yes, Lord. Everyone standing. Something is happening here tonight. <clears throat> I know that uh, there's many of you visiting tonight that, that don't understand um, the moving of the Spirit of God. We're here to testify to you. We don't fully understand that either. But we do know that there is a part of every individual, and I speak to everyone here and everyone listening at home, everyone listening by radio. There's a part of you that has got to have a touch from God or you'll die. And it's um, religion won't satisfy it, and you know that. You can sing Amazing Grace 5,000 times in a row. You can sing in a choir. You can be an usher in a church. You can be the pastor of a church, and it won't satisfy you. There's something in you that is craving an experience with Jesus, a touch from God. It's got to be real. It's got to be real. And what is happening here at this Brownsville Revival since 1995, June of 95 on Father's Day, is the Spirit of the Lord has been touching folks. I talked to a couple of young kids last night, teenagers are 17 and 18, and one of them said to me, he said, I've never seen anything like this in my life. And he said, last night, you barely touched me. And the power of God came all over me, and I fell to the ground. See, these are folks that have not been around it. They've not experienced it. But God showed up in their lives because they were hungry for a touch. And it's not the falling, friend, or the shaking. It's the openness. It's the hunger. And that is what this is all about. It's about receiving from the Lord. This dear Baptist woman, this pastor's wife, She's just receiving from God. Maybe eight months from now or five years from now, we'll be hearing of a mighty healing ministry sweeping through that area of the country. And you'll say, wow, I remember her. She testified at the Brownsville Revival. You know, who knows what's going on? Who knows what's going on, friend? How many are open to God tonight? I am too. And I really feel that something is about to happen in this place. I felt it from the moment we began to worship. See, and he inhabits that. How many felt his presence? You can, this, this morning I was worshiping the Lord in my study, and I, the same thing happened this morning that happened tonight. I was just pacing back and forth in my study early this morning, and the power of God just kept coming down, and, and I just started crying and crying and, and worshiping and crying and worshiping, and I said, I love this Jesus. And he was saying to me, I love it too. I said, Jesus, this is, this is great. It just went on and on and on and on. He's up to something tonight, friend. I want everyone to pray the prayer we've been praying since Father's Day. When I give the altar call in just a few minutes, if you're not right with God, you're going to come quickly. You're going to get right with God quickly. This is going to be a quick year. 1998 is going to speed by. And many of you are going to be put into overdrive in the things with God. You're going to quit messing with sin. You're just going to lay it down. It's going to be over with. 1998 is going to be a spectacular year for you because you've made some decisions. Right now, I want everyone to pray with me, even the atheists in this room, the people that don't believe in God. I want you to pray with me. Everyone pray together right now. Whether you're a senior or just a little tot, I want everyone to pray. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus speak, to my heart. speak to my heart. Change my life. Change my life. In, your name. in your precious name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As I listened to the testimonies a few minutes ago, I could not believe how the Lord confirmed what I'm speaking on for the next few minutes. I know that I know that this is of God tonight. I believe we've all come to this revival for answers to, answers to some perplexing questions. 
Some of us come here tonight demanding to know, does God exist? And if he does, where is he? We've had people come from all over the world looking for God. We've had them come into this place. We've had witches come into this place and sit in the back and chant against the meeting. We've had other warlocks come in this place. We've had Satan worshipers come in. We've had them sit on the front row just to check things out. If God is here, then he'll touch me. People come for all different reasons. Maybe you're here tonight going, I've heard enough about this Brownsville revival. I'm going to check it out for myself. You know, I know it sounds strange to people that don't know the Lord when we stand up here and talk about God like we know him. You need to think about that, friend. Yeah, you know God. Yeah, we do. We know him. <laughs> the, one, the one who created it all. We know him. That bothers people. That really bothers people. Not only do I know him, I talk to him all the time and he talks back. That really bothers people. Yeah, you talk to God. I was on my way to revival several months ago going down, and when I entered just into this area, and I was weeping once again just driving to revival, and it was a Saturday night. I was coming in by myself that particular night, and, and I said, Jesus, thank you. Thank you. And he spoke to me as clear as you can hear my voice tonight. He said, no, thank you. And I said, Jesus, no, thank you. He said, thank you for being obedient to me. And we just had a thank you session and just... <laughs> See, God's like that, friend. He's just looking for some people he can trust. This morning also, I pulled out Wesley's journals, and if you ever want to have a great time, every time you feel down, pastors, pull out some of Wesley's journals. You ain't down, trust me. You're not lying under a pile of stones. So I pulled out some of Wesley's journals and just sat in my study after praying and began reading some of the stuff, and I just opened it up to the middle of the book, you know, and, and I got a lot of his journals, a lot of, a lot of different books, but this particular one is, is my favorite. And I just opened it up, and it was a particular time where he was being pelted for preaching and uh, being stoned and dirt thrown on him and cursing. And then I thought, well, you know, and then I flipped to the next page, and it was worse. <laughs> flipped over three more pages, and it's worse than that. I mean, it was just nonstop. I went, Jesus, you know, you were just looking for a man who didn't care. All he wanted to do was serve you. It didn't matter what anybody thought. And John Wesley was your man. As I was reading his journal, he would just say things like, and as we left the church, we were stoned. And for two miles, we were pelted with rocks and dirt was thrown on us. And then, he, and then we arrived at our next meeting. I'm going, I got in my Jeep and I drove. And I stopped at a red light. Then I went on and arrived at Brownsville. And people said, welcome. It wasn't like that with John Wesley. But God was just looking for somebody who would serve him. That's all he's doing tonight, friend. He's looking for someone. And that's why he said to me that day, thank you. Others come here with major life-controlling problems. You need healing. You need deliverance. And you need it now. Our dear sister's testimony of her lung sickness, of her not being able to breathe, welled up inside of everyone in this place that's sick. You, you said, Jesus, if you can do it for her, you can do it for me. You're here tonight because you've got some major problems and you want God to take care of them. Others have come here out of a deep desire to get back in fellowship with God. You've been perfectly honest with yourself and you've come to the realization that you don't know the Lord. And you've come here tonight. People literally come here to get saved. I've shared this story often, but I was at one of the local malls and a man came up to me and he said, Preacher, 
I said, yes, sir. He says, I'm coming to your meeting tonight to get saved. Or Thursday night. It was like during the week. And he said, I'm coming on Thursday night to get saved. I said, no, wait a minute. You're coming to Brownsville to get saved? He goes, yeah, I've never been saved before. And I said, well, what's going on? He said, well, all my friends have been to your meeting and they've all gotten saved. So I'm coming to your meeting to get saved. You know, and there's people here tonight, there are people here tonight, you've come because you don't know the Lord, you're coming to get right with God. And some perhaps are here in this place due to a resolution, listen carefully, that you made just a few nights ago. You said on December 31st, 1997, in 1998, I'm going to get my spiritual life intact. I'm going to get right with God and stay right with God. You're here tonight. Tonight's your night. By the way, thousands of God-loving Christians come to this revival because they too have felt in their spirit that there must be more. How many believe there's more? They want more of God in their lives. They want to see more healings. They want more of His Holy Spirit operating through them. They want their shadow to heal the sick. They want more. See, it bothers me, friend. I don't know if it bothers me, but it bothers you, but it bothers me, Richard, and I know it bothers you as you read the New Testament, as you read of the works of the early church. Doesn't that bother you? It bothers me, friend. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. That bothers me. It bothers me, friend, the healings that took place all the time. It bothers me that they were, you know, raising the dead type of stuff, you know. It bothered me that there was always angels hanging out everywhere. Did you notice that in the early church? Angels came to people's aid, and they helped them out, and they saw them and stuff. And here we are 2,000 years later. You mention an angel, people say you're crazy. That bothers me, friend. I believe God wants to send his ministering angels. And I believe if we get past some of this intellect, we might see some of them. It's time. This world is waiting for a church to rise up that not only believes God, but experiences God all the time. This is entitled tonight, Be It Resolved. Be It Resolved. It won't take long, but it'll be clear as a bell. Be it resolved. I'm not going to give you one scripture text. There'll be several scriptures through it that I'll weave through it. Be it resolved. How many know what a resolution is? A resolution is a fixed purpose. It is a determination of mind. It signifies a steadfastness or a consistency in execution. I love to be around, around resolute people, people that know what they're doing. That's why I love Mike Brown. Mike Brown is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, he's just Mike Brown. He loves Jesus. Tomorrow, he's going to love Jesus. A week from now, he'll still love Jesus. Why? Because Mike loves Jesus. I don't have to come to Mike in a week. I'm not fearing that Mike is going to backslide, during, for example, during the Christmas holidays. Then I'm going to get a phone call and Mike fell back into heroin addiction. Give me a break. 20 what? How many years ago? 26 years ago, he made a decision. It's over. I'm not doing drugs anymore. I'm going to follow Jesus all the days of my life. And that Jew got right with God. I love I love to be around people like that, don't you? They have a fixed purpose. I was sitting with Pastor a few minutes ago, and I was saying to, about Lyndall Cooley. I said, and look at that man. What a gift from God. Lyndall Cooley is a gift from God. How he comes out here and leads us in worship. You'll never find Lyndall Cooley come out here and go, ah, I don't want to do this, and walk out the back door. Why? He's giving that. You laugh because that's insane. Little Cooley would never do anything like that. Why? He's made up his mind. He's got steadfastness. He comes in here at night. He said, let's go, guys. Let's get out there. What a crew. Richard Crisco, the same way. Some of you didn't catch it. How, many were, how long were you at Milton? Eight years? Eight and a half years. You didn't catch that, some of you. How long have you been here? 
A little over five years. You know what that is? Steadfastness. Eight and a half years. You know the average day of a youth pastor is like eight, ten months. Eight years, eight and a half years at Milton. Then he comes over here. Now he's here already five years. You know what that is? Commitment. That means I love young people and I'm going to give my life. I'm going to watch them go from their adolescence up through their teenage years and I'm going to marry them. I'm going to see them go on with life. And then later on I'll pastor their children. A resolution can come from a personal decision. Listen up tonight. It can be a personal thing or it can be from a corporate body. History records legislation that had resolutions that changed the course of the nation. Many of you are not familiar with it, and I'm just now becoming through this message of familiar with some of the resolutions in America. Back in the year 1800, there was a motion by a man by the name of Mr. King to the Continental Congress and the Constitutional Convention. And it says this, be it resolved that after the year 1800 of the Christian era, listen to this legislation, listen to the wording of it, that after the year 18, 1800 of the Christian era, this is America, there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in any of the states described in the resolve of Congress of the 23rd day of April, 1784, otherwise than in punishments of crimes whereof the party shall have been personally guilty. That means in 1800, friend, at really 1784, they said there will be no more slavery. And out of that came the war between the states because the Southerners just didn't want anything to do with that. If you're from Virginia back in 1798, you said this, be it resolved. That means we as a state, the state of Virginia, all the citizens, every man, woman, and child in Virginia says this, that the General Assembly of this state we express a firm resolution to maintain and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of this state against every aggression, either foreign or domestic, and that they will support the government of the United States in all measures warranted by the former. That's a resolution. In Virginia, that means 200 years ago, the people of Virginia made up their mind. We believe in the Constitution. We will die for the Constitution. We have made up our minds. Is anyone listening here? I hope you are, friend, because this is going to hit home in a minute. We declared war. Those of you from Germany, you'll remember this. It's in our history books. War is a very sad thing. But we declared war on Germany on December the 11th, 1941. We, I'm saying the United States of America. Be it resolved, the declaration says. Be it resolved. What is resolved, friend? It is a determination. It is I've made up my mind. We as a nation, be it resolved by the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled that the state of war between the United States and the government of Germany, which has thus been thrust upon the United States, is hereby formally declared. And the president is hereby authorized and directed to employ the entire naval and military forces of the government to carry on war against the government of Germany and to bring the conflict to a successful termination of all the resources of the country are hereby pledged by the Congress of the United States. And those of you who lived through that war, remember, we gave everything to that. Look up the pennies during those days. We didn't even have copper pennies. We had steel pennies because copper was too precious. Everything was given to winning that war. Be it resolved, we made up our mind. Now let's get home a little bit. Some of us made New Year's resolutions. Some of us have made good ones. I resolved to lose 25 pounds. That's all right. That's a decent one. A good one is to never use my credit card again. Another good one is to eliminate my debt early in 1998 or spend time with my kids or to be on time. Some of you that drink or smoke, you've made a resolution that I'm going to stop drinking and stop smoking. I thank God for what's going on in America right now concerning drugs and alcoholism. 
The government is spending our money wisely on some of this stuff. There's some ads coming out right now against smoking friend that are going to cause half of America to puke when they watch them. They're showing people what exactly happens when you allow that nicotine, that smoke, to come into your lungs. And they're going to show some graphic films. I believe the films are out of Australia. But they're going to show some very graphic films to let people know that smoking will kill you. Some of you teenagers have made a resolution. You said in 1998, I will not be involved with another man, another girl sexually. I'm saving myself. I've blown it in the past, but I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm going to give myself to Jesus, and I won't give myself to anybody else, no matter how much pressure they put on me. Those are some good resolutions. And then there are some crazy resolutions like, in 1998, I'll never eat a Snicker bar. Or I'll never go one mile over the speed limit. I resolve to wash my car every weekend. I resolve to not become frustrated. You're becoming frustrated, friend, trying to stick to that commitment there. I resolve to read a book a week for the next year. Those are ridiculous, crazy resolutions. I resolve to stay away from the new Burger King french fries. Those are some killers, friend. But a lot of our resolutions wouldn't stick unless there were consequences. If you're a drinker in this place, there are some serious consequences to alcohol. For example, cirrhosis of the liver, alcoholic hepatitis, fetal alcohol syndrome, alcoholic psychosis, which is brain damage. You don't know how many hundreds and hundreds of alcoholics we've prayed for in this revival. Those of you that smoke in this room, you can expect to have emphysema, asthma, lung cancer. Those of you that are active sexually outside of marriage, you can expect to pick up AIDS, syphilis, gonorrhea, or herpes. These are some consequences. That's why a lot of people make resolutions. Because there's consequences to not making them. Now let's get spiritual for a couple minutes here. Throughout the Word of God, you will find resolutions. In Joshua 24, 15, and you, those of you taking notes, just write the scriptures down. Be it resolved is the title of this message. Joshua 24, 17, you'll hear these words. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, be it resolved, we will serve the Lord. Be it resolved. Now forgive me, scholars, I am going to add those three letters, those three words as I read these scriptures because that's exactly what these are. These are resolutions. These people made up their mind. This is what they're going to do. As for me and my house, be it resolved that we will serve the Lord. You can do what you want to do. If you want to bust hell wide open, go for it. If you want to drink yourself into a sloppy, drunken hell, go ahead and do it. I'm quitting alcohol. I'm quitting drugs. I'm quitting crack cocaine. Be it resolved, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's in the Word, Isaiah 50, verse 7. For the Lord God will help me Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore, be it resolved, have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. Be it resolved, I've made up my mind, says the prophet. Romans 8, 38 and 39, for I am persuaded, be it resolved, that neither death nor life, 
nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Be it resolved. Boy, I hope you're listening because these are the kind of scriptures that just eat me alive. I read these and I go, these are men of God making up their mind, men. Look at me, every man in this room, in the balcony, those of you at home, I want you to just like, just put your eyes on that set. Sir, when are you going to start living for God? When are you going to make up your mind? that you're going to serve the Lord with all your heart. Your children are waiting for you to stand up. Your children are waiting for you to put down the smokes, to put down the bud, and pick up the Bible. The very reason some of our kids rebel is because we don't live the life at home. When are you going to do it? 2 Peter 1, verse 10 and 11. Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, be it resolved, ye shall never fall. Revelations, and it goes on, verse 11. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Revelation 2.10. Be thou faithful unto death, be it resolved, and I will give you the crown of life. Revelation 21.7. He that come overcometh shall inherit all things, be it resolved, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. I like this. I don't know if you do, but I like this. Psalm 101, verse 2. There's more in the Word. I love this. Be it resolved. The psalmist says, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. I love that. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. What a resolution. Stay with me just for a minute, would you? Psalm 116, verse 9. Be it resolved, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Verse 13, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Verse 14, I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. One of my favorites in the word of God is found in Matthew chapter 16, verse 16 through 19. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, Matthew 16, 16 through 19. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, be it resolved that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And be it resolved, I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. See, it's decision time in this place, folks. And I'm not talking about wimpy decisions. Young people, listen up. A few minutes ago, we were all worshiping God. But there's a lot of us in this room, even in our worship, we're holding back some stuff. Great is he who's the king of kings. We were worshiping God, going after Jesus. But there's an area of our life that we're still holding on to. Tonight, you're going to give it all up, friend. Tonight, you're going to give it all up. Are you listening? Don't be distracted by people walking around. And please, don't walk around unless you absolutely have to get up. You distract dozens of people when you get up, and nine times out of ten, it's not necessary. Uh, 
I loved your song a few minutes ago, Tim. You said, I am determined to live for the king. I am determined to be invincible till he has finished his purpose in me. I love that, brother. I was taking notes. I love what the man from that was at the Asbury Revival said a few minutes ago, the man from Oklahoma. You know what he said? Maybe you didn't hear it, but I'll repeat it just for this reason, because it fits. He said, be done with the world. Give it up. Did you hear that? Y'all planned all that up there, didn't you, Steve? You got all those people and talked to them ahead of time and told them to go say that. You told Tim Shepard to go say, be determined because it fits your message. No, sir. God's trying to speak to you. He's going to tell you what he's going to tell you. He's a good teacher. God's a great teacher. He's going to tell you what he's going to tell you, then he's going to tell you, then he's going to tell you what he told you. You're going to get it. Well, I've got three points in closing tonight. These are three of the resolutions of Jesus. Be it resolved. Number one, and this needs to be in your life tonight, friend. Number one, I will not yield to temptation. I will, now, matter of fact, say it with me. I will not yield to temptation. Say it again. I will not yield to temptation. If I had a big blackboard and some scaffolding, I'd put everyone on a different edge of the scaffolding, a different area, and give you a piece of chalk and have you write that a hundred times. I will not yield to temptation. See, Jesus made up his mind that he was not going to yield to temptation. I want to let you know that during the break, my wife and I, we went skiing with our family and another family. We enjoyed it out west. When you go out, when you do anything like that, there's always partiers out there. There's always, drink, always drinkers. How many know that? You can't get away from the world. But see, none of that bothers me. Want to know why? I can sit in a restaurant if somebody's across from me drinking a martini or someone's across from me drinking a beer. That doesn't bother me, friend. You want to know why? Because I made up my mind 22 years ago that I was going to drink Sprite. I made up my mind years ago, friend, that I wasn't going to smoke. I wasn't going to party. I made up my mind years ago, 18 years ago when I got married, I knew it was for life. My wife and I were going to be with, with, together forever till death do us part. It was over. Going dating, going out with other girls, looking at other girls is over. Yes. It's over. You make up your mind. Jesus made up his mind concerning yielding to, yielding to temptation. Those of you taking notes, you can write down Luke chapter 4, 1 through 13. Be it resolved, friend. You remember Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Spirit. Verse 2 of chapter 4 of Luke says, Being forty days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing, and when he were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus said to him, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil took him up to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. Think of it, friend. The Bible does not say that Jesus said, Say that again, Lucifer. You mean that everything I see, cities, homes, popularity, fine clothing, the women of the world, precious stones, all the gold and the silver, it'll all be mine? No, friend. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. Why, friend? He had already determined in his heart he was not 
going to yield to temptation. And I'm asking you, have you done that? Have you done that? The consequences of this one particular resolution, friend, are damning many people into this, in this place. You have not made this resolution. You have not determined in your heart. So what happens? You walk into a store. You walk into a 7-Eleven or Circle K and, and you see a, a, a pornography magazine and your eyes are drawn towards it. Why? You haven't made up your mind, friend. You turn on the television set and you start flipping through the channels and you see a movie and you know the movie is rated R. But you want to watch it for a little while. Why? Because you haven't determined in your heart. You haven't nailed it down, friend. You haven't made up your mind that you will have nothing like that come into these eyes. Nothing like that's going to come through these ears. See, you've got to tonight. Young people, I know this is bothering some of you. You've got to tonight do what Jesus did. And he made up his mind early, I will not yield to temptation. I'm going to do something that's very rare in the revival. I want everyone just to remain seated. There are some people being eaten alive in this place. You're being eaten alive by guilt. And here's what we're going to do. I've never done this. I, maybe I've done it once or twice. I don't know, but I don't remember it. This is rare. I want everyone to close their eyes. Everyone shut their eyes. If you've yielded to something... A temptation and you've blown it just over the last few weeks and you feel horrible about it you feel horrible about it and you, you know you've blown it but tonight this is making so much sense to you and you know that this is so this is so solid this is what you need and you want to make sure that tonight you make that resolution and you're not going to yield to that temptation, but you've blown it over the last few weeks and you want God to forgive you. I want you to slip your hand up right now. Hundreds of you got your hands up already. Hundreds. God bless you, man. You can put them back down. Put them back down. Everyone look this way. Hundreds and hundreds of hands just went up. Some of them went up so fast. Want to know what that is? You want to shake it off. You want to get the sin out of your life. You want to get it out. But let me tell you a little bit about Lucifer. I'm working on a message right now on his devices that will probably be preaching next week. He's always at your door, friend. Can I say that again? He's always there. If he fails at one thing, he'll try something else. He's always going to be there. D.L. Moody said the devil's always waiting at the foot of the mountain. So every high spiritual experience you have, get ready for the devil to be at the door. And a lot of times he ain't knocking. He's coming at you. That means you need to be so ready when he comes at you that you turn around and you say, get thee behind me. Get behind me. One of the most incredible experiences I had on the mission field concerning this very thing, and I had made up my mind years ago not to yield to anything that will drive me away from Christ. My team was in Spain. We were holding a crusade in a city park and we'd been witnessing for several weeks in that city and nothing had happened. We had, had handed out tens of thousands of tracts, my booklet, Stone Cold Heart in Spanish, and nothing happened. And I was fasting all the way through this meeting. And no one was getting saved. We had one drunk that used to follow us around and he was sort of getting saved. You know, we were thrilled at him, you know. <laughs> we were counting him too, you know. <laughs> Got one. 
but nobody was getting saved. And I was so mad at God because I was accustomed to people being saved. And I worked in Argentina, and Argentina is full of a lot of Spaniards. Argentina is a European country. And I knew that the people were basically the same. What was going on? Why weren't people being saved? And it's about two weeks into the fast. I was in a city park and our drama team had just done a drama and there was a hundred or so people watching the drama. They were standing around drinking, smoking. Some of them were cussing. I remember a group of teenagers sitting on their motorcycles. Spain's a very wealthy country. We went out to eat one time at a pizza hut, three of us. We got two pizzas and three Cokes and one salad and it cost $75. Spain was a, it's just a wealthy country. People spend money like water. And all these people were standing around. They were well-dressed. We were in a very ritzy area of the city in the city park. And I was so mad at God for not moving with the pe among the people. And I was standing, and they gave me the microphone to preach. And the people were looking at me, you know, and someone were joking and cutting up. And I remember taking the microphone, and I dropped it on the pavement. My little boy Ryan ran up and grabbed the microphone and stood right next to me. And I said out loud, Jesus, where are you? And he spoke to me. And he said, I'm right over there, Steve. And I looked way behind the crowd. There was a man covering his face like this. And I walked through the crowd and I went up to him. I said, what's happening to you? He said, there's something all over me. I said, what does it feel like? He said, it feels bad, but it feels good. And I started to explain to him what conviction was. And as I was explaining to him conviction, I looked around and everybody was watching. And the Lord said to me, now, Steve. And I went back like this. And some of my staff are here tonight. They were in this meeting. I stepped back and I said, Jesus Christ is in this park. He's here right now. Everyone who wants Jesus Christ to wash their sins away and come into their life, I want you to lift up your hand right now. And everyone that was there lifted up their hand. And I went, Jesus, now! Come down in power. And people began weeping and wailing and squalling and bawling and started giving their lives to Jesus. It was phenomenal, friend. I had never in my life seen anything like it in Spain. The workers, we had about 100 workers from Michigan that were with us. Some of you may be here tonight. I don't know. They said the same thing. They had never experienced anything like it. People were just like putty giving their lives to Jesus everywhere. The church is still there. It started. Some of the ones that were converted in that one meeting are still in the church. Phenomenal what took place. I went from there. We held two or three more meeting, meetings and started the church. I went from there. My wife was still going to fly over to Spain. She wasn't there yet. I was just there with my son Ryan. I went from there and I rented a place on the Mediterranean to rest because I'd been fasting for two weeks. I was tired. Went over to the Mediterranean, found a nice quiet resort to spend some quality time with my little boy. He was like two years old or four or two. He was alive. <laughs> Fred, revival will mess your head up, man. My little... <laughs> My little girl, Kelsey, has been in revival all her life. I mean, she's three years, you know. She's just been in, all she knows is revival. But Ryan and I, we went to that resort, and I remember we looked out in front of the resort, Richard, and it was nothing but beautiful beaches. Nobody was there. So I said, come on, boy, let's enjoy the water. So we went out there and just had the time of our life. I've always taken my family to quiet beaches where we're all alone, where we can enjoy ourselves, and there's not naked people all over the place. <laughs> So Ryan and I were sitting there at the beach, <laughs> enjoying ourselves, and this huge bus pulls up from Germany, and 60 teenagers jump off of it. 
a youth group, I guess, but not from a church, I hope. They jump off the bus and they all come running towards the water. And as they're coming, they're taking their clothes off. And I'm not talking it just down to the swimsuits. Those of you that live in Europe, you know, nude bathing is common over there. And they started taking their clothes off and the girls started taking their tops off. And I, th this was one day after that outpouring. Less than a day. And I said, Ryan, let's get out of here quick. And Ryan said, he said, Daddy, what's wrong? This is a perfect place. I said, no, son, it's not perfect. Let's get out of here quick. And we ran for our lives as a man. Because we had made up our mind. I had made up my mind years ago. I will not allow my eyes to feast on any trash of this world. I had made up my mind. You want to know why, friend? Because I've learned that sin will destroy me. And it will destroy you. Just a little look will be imprinted on your mind for days and weeks and months. You'll never be able to erase it. You'll wake up dreaming it. You'll think about it during the day. That's why you flee from it, friend. Jesus did it in the early in his ministry. He laid the foundation, get behind me, Lucifer. Whew. I remember Ryan and I, we, I got so mad I rented a motorcycle. I said, we're going to find a piece of beach somewhere <laughs> where there's nobody. That poor little boy was so frustrated. He could not understand why daddy was so adamant about getting away from all those naked people. But I'm telling everyone in this place, you better be like that. You better be like that. You want Jesus to come down in your life in 1998, you better get pure, and you better get pure quickly. You better get holy quickly. Be it resolved. I am determined. I will not yield to temptation. I will turn my head. I'll walk away. I'll run for my life. I will not yield to temptation. Some of you blew it at a business party, an office party this Christmas because you got around your friends. And they said, how about a drink? It's Christmas time. And you blew it. On the way to the revival tonight, we were driving down the road. My son's with me tonight. He's running a camera. And uh, we're driving down the road. And here come four kids, gang members, walking down the middle of the road. Down the middle of the road. You want to know what that is? Stupid. And they were walking just like this, down the middle of the road going, one, one, one. when I drove by, he goes, like that, just spits, you know? I said, Ryan, you want to know what that is? I said, that is not only stupid. I said, probably two or three of those kids are scared to death, but they're yielding to peer pressure. I said, if you ever get in a situation like that and your friends say, let's go walk down the middle of the road, And they say, you're a chicken if you don't do it. Look them in the eyes and say, I ain't chicken. It's, I'm not stupid. I'm not stupid. That's stupid. That is dumb. And you're dumb. Roads are for cars. Repeat that with me. Roads are for cars, not for people walking down the middle of it. You're stupid for doing that. And then go home and do something else. You laugh, but I want to tell you, that's how it all starts. Seven, eight, nine-year-old kids. One kid says, why don't you do this with me? And they're not smoking or drinking or doing nothing nasty. They're doing something stupid. But down the road, the same kid that got them out in the middle of the road has got to join a pot in his hand. And he said, hey, come on, let's smoke. 
Well, I'm going to close. Number two, I will do the will of my heavenly Father. I will do the will of my heavenly Father. I am resolved, number one, not to yield to temptation. Number two is to do the will of my heavenly Father. Jesus said this in John 9, 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Pay attention. I want to ask you, friend, is the will of the God, is the will of God even in the, your picture? Is, is, is he part of your plans? He's supposed to be your plans. But have you, ever, have you prayed that this year? Thy will be done on earth in me. What do you want? See, this year is not mine and it's not yours. It's his. It belongs to God. We have a large group here from the Church of God of Prophecy. Y'all stand up tonight. Let's welcome this group of pastors. We welcome you. And I say to you as a fellow messenger of the gospel that 1998 does not belong to any of you. It belongs to God. This whole year is God's year. This is His year. He's got plans. He's got desires. He's got... And it's perfect. His plan is perfect, friend. So what do you have planned for the Church of God of Prophecy in 1998, Jesus? What do you want to do through us? Woo! Well, it's easy for Jesus to say something like that because he is out there performing all these miracles. Anybody can do the will of the Father when you're raising the dead, healing the sick. feeding the multitudes. But don't ever forget during the darkest days of his life. See, because he had made up his mind. I'm sure he had goosebumps when Lazarus came out of the tomb. I think Jesus felt something. You know, that'd be cool. <laughs> Maybe it wouldn't do nothing for you, friend, but I think I'd feel it. When he said, Lazarus, come forth! And his mummy comes out of that tomb. I'm sure Jesus was standing there going, hmm, 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 hmm. Loose him. Let him go. <laughs> you know, friend, that's easy to live for God around them times. You know? That's wonderful. Everyone's looking at you going, Dear God. Good to God. <laughs> It's just God. That's God. Worship Him. Praise Him. But there came a day, friend. See, He had resolved not only to not yield to temptation, but to do the will of His Father. And Jesus had His dark days just like you do. There was a time in a garden in Matthew 26, 39, and He went a little farther and fell on His face and He prayed, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, be it resolved, not as I will, but as Thou will, Father. Thy will be done. How about it, friend? Are you saying that tonight, young people? What are you going to do with your life? What are you going to do? Is the Father in the picture? He better be the picture. My son's having a, a heyday trying to figure out what he wants to do in life. Ryan, I know you're listening to this. I'm just picking on you. He told me one day, I said, son, what do you want to be when you grow up? He said, daddy, I want to be a preacher just like you. And you know, whoa. <laughs> and then about six months later, and I said, Ryan, what do you want to be when you grow up? He said, I want to be a cop. And he saw my face, you know, if you're a cop here, it's fine, wonderful, but, you know. 
I dropped my head a little bit, and he goes, Daddy, you don't understand. He said, I'm going to have a motorcycle, and I'm going to stop people. I'm going to give them tickets on the way to church. <laughs> and then, then when I get to church, I'll preach. He's, <laughs> well, he's kids, man. <laughs> then another day he said, I've decided what I want to be, Dad. I want to be a train engineer. I went, whoa. Got sad again, you know. And, and he said, you don't understand, Dad. I'm going to drive the train to church. So, <laughs> But one of these days, my boy is going to come up to me and say, I don't know, Dad, because I've been praying. I've been talking to Jesus, and he hasn't told me yet what I'm going to be in life. And whatever what he wants me to be, Father, whatever he wants me to be, Dad, that's what I'm going to be because I've yielded myself to Jesus. His will be done. Everyone stand. Charity, come on up. My last one tonight is I will spend time with my Heavenly Father. I will spend time with my Heavenly Father. First one is I resolve to not yield to temptation. I resolve to do the will of my Father. And the last one is I resolve to spend time with my Heavenly Father. Friend, you can look up these scriptures later. Jesus was constantly praying, spending time with the Father. At his baptism, I had never seen this scripture before, Mike. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying. Never saw that. I never saw that. Also being baptized and praying. He was hanging out with his Father. Before he selected the apostles, You'll read in Luke chapter 6, verse 12 through 16. He was praying, seeking his father's wisdom. At his transfiguration in Luke chapter 9, and it came to pass about eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, it all took place. Moses and Elijah appeared. You know, even when things were going great, for those of you in this room where things are going great, one of the reasons I was praying this morning is because things are going great. You hear me? People ask us how things are going. We go, great. They're just, you know, you're going through trials all the time. All the time. Non-stop. Trial list. Big list. All the time, but I don't measure my life according to all these trials, friend. You live in the mully grubs. For those of you translating and from other countries, mully grubs is a, is a low, sad place. <laughs> I, <laughs> I hurt for the translators. But in Mark chapter 1, I read in verse 32 through 35 that Jesus was out there healing the diseased and the possessed with the devils were being delivered. And it said all the city was gathered at his door. That's cool. Pastor, that's cool. The whole city was at your church. You know what Jesus did? He got up in the morning, rose up a great while before day, went out and departed into a solitary place and spent time with his father. In the midst of an incredible move of God, he's hanging out with the Father. How about it tonight? I resolved at the beginning of this year that I'm not going to yield to temptation. I'm going to do the will of the Father. Those of you that have made radical changes to come to Brownsville School of Ministry, good for you. Maybe it's the first time you're doing the will of the Father. I don't know. Maybe you've been doing the will of the Father all along. But don't think it too radical that you move from New Zealand here or you move from Seattle here or New York City. 
and left a lot of stuff to come to the school. I commend you. God bless you. But just remember, Jesus left heaven. He left it all to come down to this measly, slimy, dusty earth to save a lot like us. You're doing the will of the Father. Not yielding to temptation, doing the will of the Father, and you're going to spend time this year, you're going to talk to God. Look at me, folks. Also, determine in your heart not to fall into bondage this year. You know what kills me? It's people that have a one-hour devotional time and they miss 15 minutes of it, and they're in the, the they're, they're under, all the rest of the day, they're in the pits. They're the slave. They're, you're a slave to that devotional time. Okay? I believe in devotional time. But learn how to worship God through the day also. Amen. If you don't get in the whole hour, sprinkle it through the day. Amen. Break away at work. Take a walk. Talk to God. You get around people that are in bondage all the time, man. You just, you, they, it, it's, it's clammy. It's difficult to be around people like that. Be free, friend. Your relationship with Jesus should be just constant. I love my relationship with Jesus. We spend time together, but other times I'm, I'm shooting rocket prayers to him. Tonight when we pray, I'll be praying hundreds of prayers tonight, and he's hearing every single one of them. I don't have to hover over every person. Our prayer team doesn't have to hover over every person and work God up. When you say, I've got cancer, I need healing, I say, Jesus, more of your presence in her life. So don't fall into bondage this year, friend. Stretch yourself to the limit. Two hours, three hours, four hours, five hours, whichever you can spend, quality time with God, that's wonderful. Some days you can do that. Other days you can't. But go after God. Amen. Spend time with your Father. Those of you in the chairs, move them to the left and the right. Something's about to happen, friend. How many are expecting God to do something in your life? Good. Is Hazel still with us? Is she here? Hazel was with us last night. She's a singer on the team. Maybe her husband, Benny's here tonight. He's a bearded one that plays the, the bass. Hazel's pregnant. How, how far along is she? Eight months? Woo! She's real pregnant. <laughs> but you know, you get around Hazel, and I think they got about 83 kids now. <laughs> but you get around Hazel... <laughs> It's a secret to the Brownsville Revival, friend. That's, that's where they're coming from, Hazel and Benny. <laughs> but we love that couple. But Hazel, you know, if you got around Hazel and you said, uh, if you said something like, Hazel, do you, um, do you hope you're going to have a baby? No, friend, she's going to have a baby. She's expecting. You know what that means? It's going to happen. Maybe right here in the revival one night. It's going to happen. She's going to have a baby. That's how we live at the Brownsville Revival. When I give this altar call and I say that God's going to forgive you, we know it. We expect him. We know he's going to do it. I don't hope he's going to do it. I know he's going to do it. Just as sure as Hazel's going to have a child. And it's been clockwork, friend. She's just been having them, so she's pretty... <laughs> You're going to receive forgiveness because that's what God's into. And those of you that are dry and thirsty tonight, you need a fresh anointing. God's going to do the same. He's going to pour out His Spirit. He's not playing games. I, speak to message, I spoke a message one night entitled, The Expectant One. And as I was preparing that, I thought, what a difference those people that, that go after God just knowing any minute He's going to do it for them. Everyone in this room, those of you at home, I want you standing also. If you're in this place and you're backslidden, there's sin in your life, 
You're doing something Jesus would never do. I want to tell you tonight, He'll forgive you, He'll wash you, He'll cleanse you, He'll make you new. But you got to do what I'm about to tell you to do. Charity is going to sing mercy seat. Mercy is undeserved forgiveness. When she begins to sing this, and I give this altar call, you're going to come quickly down here. You're backslidden. You can sit in front of a TV set and watch junk. Your eyes can fall on a magazine cover and you don't turn your head. That's sin. That's sin. I'm working on a book right now called You Knew Better. It's going to be in the secular market. And it's all about sin. A major publisher wants to put it out because they know this nation is ready to hear this. And it's called You Knew Better. Every man and woman drinking in the bars tonight, every one of them know better. And you knew better. You know it's sin. You know it's wrong. And you know Jesus Christ would never do that. You're going to come in just a minute and you're going to get forgiveness. He's going to wash you. He's going to cleanse you. You're going to come quickly. Those of you in this room that are religious, maybe you know all about Jesus, but you don't know him. I want to let you know that you can go to hell with a choir robe on. You can go to hell with a communion cup in your hand and a wafer in your mouth. You can go to hell with a certificate of ordination from the Assemblies of God, the Baptist, the Church of God of Prophecy, the Methodist hanging behind your desk. You can go to hell, friend, even with a certificate of ordination if you don't know Jesus. Religion will damn you, friend. Religion is all the little pious acts. You know, there's people during this Christmas season that worked at the rescue missions. They worked in the food lines. They rang bells for Salvation Army. They took up toys for tots and coats for kids. They scratched that little spiritual itch. And they feel good about themselves. And they say, surely God will see my good works. It's not by works of righteousness which you are saved, but according to his mercy he saved us. It's mercy. You can't get to heaven outside of the blood of Jesus Christ. So tonight I'm going to give you the opportunity to get right with God, religious person. And for those of you that have never known the Lord, come and taste and see that the Lord is good. Come down to these altars and experience God. I can't make it any clearer for you, friend. You've got to meet him. You've got to meet him. You've got to meet him. The other day I was in a, in a, in a drug store and a lady came up to me and she said, I cannot believe this. She said, you're the evangelist from the Brownsville Revival. And she said, I wasn't going to come to this drug store. And you know, it's one of those spiritual things, you know, she spiritualized the whole thing. And, but here you are and, and, and said, what's, what's up? What do you need? She said, would you pray with me? I said, what, for my family, they're all in sin. I said, yeah, right now, we'll pray right now in the drugstore. I went, Jesus, I pray for her family right now. When she left out of there, we had met, friend. She could go to anywhere she wants to and say, listen, the, the evangelist at Brownsville, I'm not saying I'm a hot shot or anything. It's just something that happened. Prayed with me at the drugstore. I don't believe you. It happened. We prayed together at the drugstore. I prayed for your soul, Papa. I prayed for you, son. The evangelist and I, we agreed together. You know what that was? That was an encounter. It was a meeting, and that's what has to happen with you down here. You've got to meet Jesus. You've got to come in contact with him. You've got to hold his hands and say, Jesus, forgive me, wash me, cleanse me, Jesus. It's got to be real, friend. It's not something you do in a pew in some wishy-washy, Jesus, you know, forgive me, wash me, cleanse me, Jesus. You know, if you're out there, do something for me. No, friend. Do I have to go forward? Yes, sir. In the balcony? Yes, sir. Those of you at home, you're going to have to get on your knees in front of that television set. Those of you listening in your cars, I want you to pull over to the side of the road. If you need forgiveness, I want you to pull over. Pull into a parking lot. Pull over on the interstate where it says emergencies only. This is an emergency. We're going to pray. 
You're going to ask the Lord to forgive you. You're going to ask him to wash you. Why do I have to come forward, Steve? Why not? What's your problem? Is it pride? I want you to think about something. I'm closing with this. you got a problem coming forward. I want you to think about the one who died for you. He was beaten. He was mocked. He was slapped. A crown was pressed on his head. The thorns ripped his skin. Blood, I'm sure, dripped into his eyes. I'm sure they stung. He was beaten. His back, from the back of his neck to his buttocks, was ripped apart by a whip that had pieces of glass and bone tied to it. It was shredded like ribbons. A beam was placed on his back and he was ordered to haul it up to a hill called Golgotha. When he got there, he was stripped. Most theologians would agree with this and you can have a hard time if you want to with it. Most theologians believe he was totally naked on the cross. They laid him on his back took his loincloth off, took everything off. Please keep in mind there were women there. His followers were there. The priests, the religious people were there all watching Jesus being stripped naked. His feet were pierced, his hands were pierced. And when he was elevated above the crowd so everyone could see him clearly, One of the gospel writers said the women watched him from afar, from a, a distance. I never even pay any attention to that, but I wonder if that's because of the humiliation of the nudity. I don't know. I don't know what it was like that day, friend. It's just not real clear. But what is, what is clear is that he was humiliated he was punished, he was brutalized for you. Hung on top of Mount Calvary, not behind it, on top of it. For everyone in this room, if you were there, just behold him. He did that for you, friend. Then he looks from the cross and he says, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. He went all the way to Calvary, hung naked on the cross for you, and you can't walk 25 feet for him. Think about it, friend. See, he came to take away the sin of the world. When he said, it is finished, that was it. It was done 2,000 years ago. Your sin was punished. Everything Steve Hill did in his drug life was washed on Calvary. He took every one of those jabs and the, the spikes. It was all for me so that I might be set free. All for you. But you can't walk 25 feet to receive that. Something's wrong somewhere, friend. Don't let pride hold you back tonight. Don't let pride keep you from Jesus. Don't let pride say to you, I'm going to go home and do this in my closet, in my hotel. I'm going to be alone and do this. This is, this is a private thing. No, friend, this is a public thing. Calvary was public. Getting right with God is public. Charity's going to sing mercy seat. Everyone in this room that needs forgiveness, everyone in this room that's backslidden, everyone in this room you know there's something in your heart between you and God, everyone who's never known the Lord, everyone who is religious but you're away from Jesus. If you need forgiveness, I want you to come right now. Hurry right now. Hurry right now. Come on right now. If you need forgiveness, I want you to come right now. Hurry, get on your face before the Lord. Let's go. In the balcony, let's go. In the balcony, I let's go. Come on. Of sin on my own. Hurry. Hurry. Hurry in the balcony. Of a place Come on. I could go.
being resolved? Have you made up your mind to not yield to temptation? Have you made up your mind to do the will of the Father? Have you made up your mind that in 1998, I'm going to spend time with my Father in heaven? Get on your face and say, Jesus, forgive me, wash me, cleanse me, make me new. Do it. Do it. Come on, sir. Come on, man. Do it. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Of a lifetime of sin. Yes. Yes. Lovely illusions. They never come true. Come on. Come on. But I know where there's a place of mercy for you. altar keep your heads bowed your eyes closed just before the Lord right now I'm gonna close this altar call right now with this call Lendl's gonna sing a couple verses of Lord have mercy with the team and I'm gonna give you one last opportunity friend because the reason I'm not gonna drag this out tonight is for this reason I preach tonight be it resolved be it resolved that means you're determined I'm not going to be able to stand up here and convince you that you've got to be determined. It's something you've got to make up your own mind. The people here at this altar have made up their minds. But some of you are still just, just one little nudge and you'll come down here and it'll stick. I know it will. So here's what we're going to do in closing this altar call. I'm going to have everyone in this room, everyone in the balcony in the main auditorium, you're going to turn to the person next to you and you're going to ask them this question. Do you need Jesus Christ to forgive you? Wait just a minute before you do it. Do you need Jesus Christ to forgive you? And when someone asks you that question, don't lie to them. If there's something in your heart between you and God, then I want you to tell them yes. And then I want both of you to come to the altar. Well, Steve, what, is this, what's, what does this really mean? Friend? We've had sinners that have never known the Lord saved during this time right now that are still living for God. Still living for God. We've got folks in our Bible school that were saved during a time like this when someone turned to them. Would it stick? We've seen it stick. Sometimes it takes a little help from a friend and that's what we're doing right now. Yes, somebody will go with you. Someone will walk with you. You're going to turn to the person next to you. You're going to ask them if they need forgiveness. And if they say yes, 
And sir, ma'am, be honest. Both of you come down together. Everyone do that right now. Turn to the person next to you. Turn to the person next to you right now. Ask him, then come down. Yes. Yes, come on. 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 Take all I said. Come on. He's here. He's here. He's here in this place, friend. He'll wash you. He'll cleanse you tonight. He'll wash you. He'll cleanse you. Those of you at this altar that have been backslidden, the Lord is going to wash you clean. And let me tell you some good news. According to his word, he will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. That means he'll make up for lost time. He'll forgive, he'll wash, he'll cleanse, and he'll restore the years that the locusts have eaten, that the devil has destroyed in your life. The Lord is going to restore those years. Those of you in this place that have never known the Lord, when we pray right now, he's going to come into your life, just like he's done for over 100,000 people that have come. Over 300,000 have come to these altars. God's forgiven, God has washed. And for those of you that are religious, you're gonna leave out of here and there's never, you won't ever go to church to find Jesus. You're gonna to go to church with Jesus. Yeah. Pastors, I wanna tell you it's heaven when people come to church with Jesus in their hearts. Man alive. It's heaven. And then when people do wander in that have never known the Lord, there's a body of Christ there ready to minister to them. Everyone at this altar, bow your heads, and I want you to pray with me right now. And please, this is Saturday night. The demons of hell are running rampant all over this nation and the world. They're having a heyday all around this city. I want you to lift up your voice when you pray tonight. I want the devil and the demons to hear this vocalized. I want them to hear your prayer. The Lord could hear it if you were just, if you were just saying it silently. But I want you to say it out loud right now as a confirmation, as a resolution tonight. Say it with me right now. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus thank, you thank you for your presence, for your presence in this place. This place. Thank, you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, for not leaving me alone. Leaving me alone. Thank, you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, that you made up your mind, you up your mind. that you would not yield to temptation. You would, not yield to temptation. You would do the will of the Father and that you would spend time with him. Tonight, Jesus, I resolve to do the same. Forgive me. I have sinned. I have hurt you. I have hurt others. And I've hurt myself. Forgive me, Jesus. Wash me, Jesus. Cleanse me, Jesus. I repent. I ask you tonight 
to be my Savior, to be my, savior. My, Lord, my Lord, and my very best friend. Very best friend. From this moment on, this moment I, am yours, I am yours, and you are mine. You are mine. From this time on, this your, will your will is my will. Is my what, will. You want, what you want, I want. I want. You're my Lord. You're my, You're my master. You're my I'm the slave. I'm, the slave. I'm your servant. I'm servant. Do, with Do with me whatever you please. Whatever you please. I, mean I mean this. I pray this prayer, pray this prayer. at the beginning of a brand new year and I will commit myself to every word of it throughout this year in your precious name in Jesus name amen